Let's still our hearts and our souls as we come deeper into the presence of God. Holy God, we gather here to worship your name. We come because you have loved us. We come because we seek peace. We come because we seek your salvation. We come to celebrate your salvation, your goodness, your hope, and your healing. Lord, accept everything that we are as we come into your presence. We offer it to you and to your glory. And may your Holy Spirit flow in this way, in this place, and touch us in ways that we did not expect, in ways that move us, deeper into your presence and into this world sharing your good news. Lord, we are here. Join us. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Welcome this morning. Welcome guests. We have guests from Pennsylvania and, and uh, Kansas City area and other places as well. Our youth are still on the road. They should be coming through probably the Kansas City area right about now. They stayed night in Columbus, Missouri. And if you're wanting to know what sort of work they've done, uh, you can go on the Facebook page and see the uh, pictures there. You don't need to have a Facebook account, um, but it's there for you to see. And uh, you may also come next week, Sunday school hour, starting at 9.30 to hear the report of the week in Virginia that they had. You are welcome to this place to give thanks, to bring your burdens, to be in the presence of Jesus Christ. Stand up and greet someone in the name of Jesus. Let's remain standing and sing the, uh, the song as an invitation of why we are here. Come, now's the time to worship. And you'll notice the reference to the Philippian passage that we're going to work on just in between the two songs, that, uh, that every tongue will confess, every knee will bow. Let's sing. Come, now's the time to worship.
can sit down just for a little bit. Our theme this morning has a lot to do with humility. And humility doesn't just mean that uh, we are humble because we know who we are in the face of God, although that is the source of our humility. Um, it comes from the very character of Jesus. This morning, I was pretty proud and happy. I had the sermon done. Everything was going well. I was drinking my morning tea. Top of the world, when all of a sudden the dogs were barking, and out walks the bull that was on our yard. Out onto the yard. Well, we can get that in real quick. So we get out there, and it takes off running. <laughs> and all the neighbor cows, I think, were calling to it. So it, it, it didn't have cookie social on its mind. And uh, it goes, and it jumps over into the neighbor's yard. OK, I come back. I am mad. I mean, as mad as a preacher can be. <laughs> and who left the gates off? Like, how did it get out? And one of the gates was not directly open, but the secondary gate, if it had been shut, then it wouldn't have gotten out into the world. So I very self-righteously gave a lecture about how we should shut the gates all the time. And this is why we do it. And both Reuben and Hannah looked at me and said, didn't you leave that gate open? <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> Humility, it's a good thing for us. And I like the saying on the fronts of the bulletins that it's, and I think it really fits well, a mistake that makes you humble is better than achievement that makes you arrogant. Where might that be rooted? Well, it's rooted also in the image of who Jesus was in our lives. And it's rooted actually in what we think is one of the earliest psalms, one of the earliest songs sung by the church and it's found in Philippians. If you have any encouragement from being united in Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look, not look only to your own interests, but also the interests of others. Your attitude, and, here's, and, 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 and really you could say, Paul is saying, and this is why I'm saying what I just said. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, our King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of everything that is, who being in very nature God, who was God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, something to be, uh, something to be uh, uh, used for his own sake, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a human. He humbled himself, and he became obedient even to death even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing. To God be the glory. No, all hail the power of Jesus' name. And there's a point where you see this scripture come out, and we're going to stand. If you feel like kneeling, you sure may. But raise your voices as a glorious chorus in praise to our uh, Christ.
Amen. You may be seated. Let's continue our praise and thanksgiving with the giving of gifts to God's kingdom. Thank you, Chris, for reminding us of the words and the reason why we give back to the kingdom. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Let's give thanks. Praise God from whom all blessings found out we had a little bit of a technical difficulty. So we're going to kick it old school if that's okay. <laughs> if you feel obliged to join me, please do so. Softly and tenderly Jesus is calling, calling for you and for Home. 
the altar call for today. Powerful, thank you. Let's turn to Matthew. Gospel of Matthew, the 23rd chapter. So Jesus is almost at the end of his ministry here in the Gospel of Matthew. He's in Jerusalem already. Making his way to the cross. And he's interacting with all the good church people when he says this. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. That means they have authority. They are the teachers. They're carrying on the tradition of Moses' teaching. So you must obey them and do everything they tell you, but do not do what they do. <laughs> Listen to their teaching, but don't observe their actions. For they do not practice what they preach. <laughs> That's where we get that saying from. 
They tie up heavy loads and put them on man's shoulder, on people's shoulders. And they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move that load, and probably not even to put that load on them. Everything they do is done for people to see. They make their phylacteries wide and the tassels on their garments long. They love the place of honor at banquets, the most important seats in the synagogues. They love to be greeted in the marketplaces and to have people call them rabbi or reverend, maybe. I don't know. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have only one master, and you all are brothers. And it's actually on that basis that in a lot of Mennonite traditions, they don't allow the, word, the, the idea of titles. A lot of Mennonite churches, when my dad heard that people were calling me reverend, he said, you are a Mennonite, we don't call each other by titles. This is why. You are not to be called by your title, for you have only one master, and you are all brothers and sisters. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have but one father, and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called teacher, for you have one teacher, the Christ. The greatest among you will be your servant. For whoever exalts themselves will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. <laughs> Heavenly Father, you give us sort of tough things to chew on this morning. Help me to speak to them. Help us to understand them, to live them out, to make them part of who we are so that we might be of the same mind as you. Amen. A Texas rancher met up with a Vermont dairy man one day, and the two began talking about their land. The dairy farmer told the Texas cattleman that he operated his business on 125 acres of land. <laughs> the Texan scoffed at that. Such a small piece of land. He said, Yankee, that ain't nothing. On my ranch, I get in my truck in sunrise, and I won't reach the fence line of my property until sunset. He was truly a Texan. <laughs> yeah, snorted the dairyman. I used to have a truck like that, too. <laughs> Bragging rights, bragging rights. Everybody wants them, right? Whether it's the biggest house, whether it's the fanciest car, the biggest piece of land, the most impressive digs, the most well-behaved children. Everybody wants to be the top dog in life, or if you remember a sermon from about four years ago, the top chicken of the pecking order. This is the desire to be first. And really, I think that's what we call pride. When it says in scriptures and Romans, pride goes before the fall, pride leads to us falling. It's a good Greek concept that the hubric, those with hubris will always be caught in their hubris. Pride goes before the fall. This is called pride, wanting to be first, the best, believing that to be and promoting that to be. Now, the interesting thing is, if you haven't caught on to that yet, God has some pretty pointed things to say about that sort of attitude in our lives, about those who have too much of it. Now, you heard the passage I read to you from Matthew 23, where Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and the leaders. And you see the leaders of Jesus' day wanted to look around, wanted to be looked at, and they want to be treated as though they were quite something. After all, they had gone to seminary, they had studied Greek and Hebrew and Anabaptist history and systematic theology and had paid money for it and now deserved the title. Get the hint? They wanted to be treated as though they might just be a step closer to God than anyone else. And just like many people today, Pharisees wanted other people to see them as special and as holy. They wanted others to be impressed with how religious -y they were, how churchy they were. And they, didn't, and, and they wanted others to think that they had some sort of special bragging rights that the common person, the lay person, doesn't have. After all, you don't speak Hebrew and Greek like I do. They were chest thumpers. Oh, yeah. And you can almost hear them saying, Hey, look at me. Look how important I am. 
See how broad my phylacteries are. See how long my fringes are. I'm all that and much more. Now, <laughs> yeah, that whole phylactery and fringes bit, what in the world does that mean? Well, phylacteries were small leather boxes containing portions of the Word of God, of the Old Testament, often the Ten Commandments or other teachings straight from the books of Moses. Jesus mentions them in today's passage. They were worn by Jewish people, and some, you still see some of them when they go to worship. They'll, they'll have a box on their head. Uh, and this is worn by Jews who very literally interpret the instruction to fasten God's word to your forehead and to your forearms and to the, the pillars of your, or to the door frames of your, of your house, as in Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is the Shema. Hear, O people, that the, that the Lord is one, the Lord is God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then it goes on to say, teach this to your children in your rising and your waking. And put this on your forehead and put it on your hands as a way to remember God's word. And there are people that took that very literally. And the Pharisees did that. And to show how literally they did it, they made sure their phylactery, their box, was bigger than your boxes. They got him, I suppose, special for graduating from seminary. I don't know. But you knew whose box was bigger and who was doing better. Now, the fringes are also instructions from the Bible. It's what Moses teaches in Numbers 15. He instructs the children of Israel to put fringes on their clothing. And what you see it is sort of these little tassels that come off of your, your shirt. You'll see tassels. And, and that's still done in orthodox settings or in very literal settings. And, and that was, and in, in a lot of ways, these are very nice practical things that remind you. They're memorials to what you're supposed to do. And if you have a friend, you feel it, and, and you're reminded to talk about, to, to remember uh, God's law in general. But not just God's law in general. Each of those probably even have significance according to which law you are to follow. So it reminds them, very, it's, it's a very good teaching device. Because there's nothing like a string on your finger or taking communion or those sort of rituals that help you remember the meaning of it. They're teaching tools. But the Pharisees made their phylacteries big, and they made those fringes longer than anyone else. That's like in, I remember my cousins in Paraguay. There are two Mennonite colonies side by side, and they have competition all the time. And each of them built a soccer field. But not just any soccer field, they built lights. And the accusation is, is that the Menos, that's my colony, went over to the Fahrenheimers and asked them, how tall will your lights be? And they said, well, 30 meters. And they built theirs 32 meters high. You get the point? That's what the Pharisees were doing. They put more writing into them. They used larger letters. They were more visible. They appeared more holy. More holy. They wanted to show the world not only did they follow the law, they followed all of it. Remember Paul from last week? I, as a Pharisee, there is no more person more righteous than me. I am doing the whole thing. I'm sure they didn't like it then one bit when Jesus points out how these men, about how these men dressed to draw attention to themselves, and that in fact it was more about pridefulness than it was about faithfulness. Do you think they liked that being pointed out to them? No wonder they wanted Jesus. No doubt, some even wanted to appear religious without actually being religious. I mean, who really needs to act out your faith? Who really needs to grow in your faith? Who really needs to deal with all this mushy Jesus relationship stuff when I've got that out for, outward stuff? When my fringes are plenty long and my phylactery is pretty big and after all that's all people need to see. I go to church on Sunday morning. I even go to Wednesday night. I help out. That's good enough. At least they know that I'm important or I do what I need to do prideful holiness, drawing attention to the fact that they were higher, a level higher, wanting to be a level higher than others in the kingdom of God. And they were convinced that doing this would put them first in the kingdom of God. 
And yet Jesus speaks truth into that. What does he say? He says, those who seek to be first in truth shall be last. How often have we heard the first shall be last and the last shall be first? Now that's an upside down kingdom. God is not impressed with pride. People, God is not interested in how great you are. God doesn't care about your phylacteries and your fringes. And you say, well, I don't do any of that. But you do. We all do. It's human nature. We all have our phylacteries and our fringes that we hope that other people see. And we are trying to impress the other. Or maybe even in trying to impress God to be first into the kingdom. No, instead, God is interested in how great others are made as a result of your life. God is not interested in how great you make yourself in life. God is interested in how great you make others in your lives as a result of your life. Mrs. Thompson, Ms. Thompson taught Teddy Stollard in fourth grade. He was slow, he was unkept, he was a loner, shunned by his classmates. The previous year his mother had died and what little motivation for school he may have had was now gone. Ms. Thompson didn't particularly care for, for Teddy either, but at Christmas time he brought her a, a special small present. Ms. Thompson's desk was covered with well-wrapped presents from other children, but Teddy's came in a, in a brown sack with some string tied around it. And when, he opened, when she opened it up, there was a gaudy rhinestone bracelet with half of the stones missing. And there was a bottle of cheap perfume. <laughs> Children began to laugh and snicker and tease, but Ms. Thompson saw the importance of the moment, and she quickly splashed some of the perfume on and put on the bracelet, pretending that Teddy had given her something incredibly special. At the end of the day, Teddy, or Ms. Thompson, got down on her knees and she, she uh, talked to Teddy. And Teddy finally got the courage to talk to her and, and she, he said, Ms. Thompson, um, you, you smell just like my mother. Her bracelet, her bracelet looks real good on you, Ms. Thompson. I'm glad you like my presence. And after Teddy left, Ms. Thompson remained on her knees and she asked God for forgiveness. She prayed for God to use her as she tried not only to teach these children but to love each of them as well. And she became a new teacher. Now, Ms. Thompson didn't hear from Teddy for a long time. She loved helping students like Teddy and by the end of the year uh, students like he and he had done this as well and others they caught up and they were doing quite well. And she hadn't heard from Teddy for a long time, and when she received this note all of a sudden, the note said, Dear Ms. Thompson, I want to let you know, want you to be the first person to know, that I'll be graduating second in my class, love Teddy Stollard. Four years later, she received another note. Dear Ms. Thompson, they just told me I'll be graduating first in my class, and I want you to be the first to know. University hasn't been easy, but I liked it. Love, Teddy Stallard. Four years later, another letter. Dear Ms. Thompson, as of today, I am Dr. Theodore Tollard, MD. How about that? I wanted you to be the first person to know I'm getting married next month, and I want you to come and sit where my mother would sit if she were alive. You are the only family I have now. Dad died last year. Love, Teddy Stollard. Ms. Thompson went to the wedding and sat there where Teddy's mother would have sat. She made a difference. She let God use her as an instrument of his love, an instrument of his encouragement. She got down and she served. And some of the greatest blessings in life come when you humbly re realize that someone else is more important than you are. If you want to be somebody, put someone else in front of you, before you. And serve them. Now, we Christians are always under the microscope. We often have to deal with questions like, are you living a life worthy of, of, of who you say you are? Or are you just not practicing what you preach? 
Are you really living a life worthy of being called a child of God, or are you a hypocrite wearing a mask? That's what Jesus was saying about those Pharisees. Are you for real? Are you for real, or are your phylacteries and your fringes just for show? Who are you trying to impress? Francois Fenelon was the court preacher for King Louis XIV. And if you know about King Louis XIV, he demanded full respect. He built a whole palace just for himself, known as the Sun King, 1600s, into the 1700s. And one Sunday, the king, the king was going to worship service. He had his attendants, and, and if you know anything, they lived in, in the... Uh, uh, Oh, come on. What's the name of the palace? Who took history? <laughs> Versailles. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody took history. They were in the palace of Versailles. So he built it so everything would rotate around him. So when he went to worship, he expected everyone to be here. Where, he, where, the, king, where the sun is, there should be the planets as well. So you get the point of who he thought of himself and what he thought of himself. And Francois Fenelon was a court preacher. And King Louis shows up for church one Sunday morning, the story is told, but no one was, else was there except for the preacher. What's going on here? What does this mean? The king demanded. Fenelon replied, Well, I had announced to all the others that you weren't coming to church today so that your majesty might see who serves God in truth and who just comes to flatter the king. Who are we trying to impress? When Jesus came, he wasn't looking for glory. He was looking for you. He was looking for me. He was looking for all of us. Did you hear that in Philippians? This was God. But he didn't take this as something to, to take advantage of. He's looking for all of us to present himself as a present to us. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, be a servant to all, just as Christ was. Become great by being a servant. Become the greatest by serving others, as Christ did. There was a pompous-looking deacon. Our deacons are very humble, by the way. But there was a pompous-looking deacon, and he was trying to impress upon a Sunday school class of boys um, the importance of living a good Christian life. We probably all have these sort of people in our lives. And so he asked, why do people call me a Christian? It was quiet, and no one asked, answered anything. So he asked again, why do people call me a Christian? And finally, one of the boys shyly spoke. He said, well, maybe it's because they don't know you yet. <laughs> Listen up. Jesus says, all who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. And Jesus said that about himself. He being God, he said, I came to serve, not to be served. What influences do you have or could you have with others? Your influence is measured by your willingness to serve, to give of yourself, to have the same mind as that of Christ who came to serve and not to be served. Take Gandhi for an example. One day he stepped onto a train and one of his shoes slipped off and it landed on the track. And he was unable to get it because the train was already moving. And to the amazement of his companions, Gandhi calmly took off the other shoe and he threw it back out there so it landed right beside the one that had that had fallen off. And one of the fellow passengers asked him, Why, why'd you do that? And Gandhi smiled and he said, the poor man who finds the shoe lying on the track will now have a pair that he can use. Jesus Christ in our lives is working to get out, to release the power of Christ of, in service to others. And we cannot fool God like we can fool people. 
As it says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord doesn't see like humans see. That They look on the outward appearances. They look at the phylacteries and the fringes and, and all the nice little things that, that we might be setting up so that they think highly of us. But the Lord looks at the heart. God sees through our pretending and posturing, our broad phylacteries and our long fringes. They don't impress God. We are called to live a life of humility, of humble, real, active service to others. That man, humble is being hard, sort of like old Mac Davis sings. Oh Lord, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. Well, whatever, something like that, right? I can't wait to look in the mirror because I get better looking each day. <laughs> to know me is to love me. I must be quite a man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> One last story. During the American Revolution, a man in civilian clothes, he rode past some soldiers who were repairing a small defensive wall. And their leader was up on a horse and he was shouting orders and instructions, but not really helping them. He, was, he knew exactly how this all worked and he was telling them. He was being great help telling them. <laughs> when the rider asked the leader who was sitting up on his horse giving all these instructions, why aren't you helping? This leader retorted with great dignity because, sir, I am a corporal. Stranger apologized, sorry man, I didn't know you were a corporal. He dismounted and he proceeded to help the exhausted soldier and when the job was finally done, he turned to the corporal and he said, Mr. Corporal, next time you have a job like this and you don't have enough men to do it, go to your commander-in-chief and I will help you again. That stranger was George Washington. Greatness comes from sacrifice and service. Service comes from humility. What might be said of us? at Bueller Mennonite Church. And it's good then to remember the words of our Lord to us, for whoever exalts themselves will be humbled, and whoever humbles themselves will be exalted. Amen. Let's stand, and let's send each other with a blessing. Twice through again, the first time through, Think of someone who isn't here who needs this blessing. And the second time through, you're blessing the other here in this place as you say goodbye for another week. As you go out from this place, might the Lord put in your pathway something that annoys you, something that gets in your way, something that makes you say, I just don't have time to do this. Don't you know how important I am? Don't you know how important it is where I'm going? Don't you know how important it is for me to keep going? And then may you have the grace and the power to enter that thing in your way and to show it, show them, show it, the light the love and the peace of Christ.
Go as children of God. Amen. Amen.